into the uh, debate on the main bill, I know there are a few uh, senators who have commitments elsewhere, and I wonder if, with the consent of the minority leader, we could read the last section as to the main bill and permit uh, a few selected uh, senators to run their ways elsewhere. Last section on a resolution. The, the secretary will call the question, yes, you will. and the senators who wish to record their votes may do so at this time. Anderson, Bloom, Conco, Markey, Orange, Ward, Winnico, Mr. Lewis. Senator Bernstein. Bernstein. Aye. Senator Marino. Aye. Senator Calandra. This is on the ERA amendment. This is on the main amendment. The main, nay. Senator Cameron. Aye. Senator Dunn. Aye. Senator Skirmahorn. No. Just a moment, please. The secretary is having difficulty keeping track of this now. Senator Rawson, just a moment, please. Senator Straub, why did you ask? Madam President, I have a name called. Mr. Straub? Yes. President, I have no name called. Senator Rawson. Mr. Rawson? No. Senator Hudson? No. <laughs> yes. The chair has has you, Senator, as the first speaker in the list of senators who wish to debate the main motion. Senator Beatty, excuse me. Uh, yes, I want to vote. Senator Beatty wishes to vote at this time. So yes. Aye. Mr. Beatty in the affirmative. Other than the negative, please. Senator Santucci in the negative. Yes. The bill. Senator Meyerson, you have the floor. Senator Nolan would like to know whether he goes first or I do, and I yield that decision to you. Senator Nolan, Senator Meyerson had the floor hours ago, yielded it to Senator Gold for the purpose of debating the Eckerd Amendment, and therefore, in, in the order, he has, his, he has the floor at this time. Madam President, again the voices raise in octaves. The blood quickens for the battle. The positions become more heated and entrenched. The arguments more strident. Spring is here, and with it, the Equal Rights Amendment. It is time again to don one's ideological armor and enter the political arena and strike a blow. Madam, Madam President, Madam President, would you please restore order to the chamber? Would the chamber establish some order, please, and the visitors refrain from moving about. And senators, please take their chairs for the purpose of this debate. It's been going on for hours, and I know that everyone is interested in seeing the debate move along as expeditiously as possible. Senator Meyerson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. It is time again to don one's ideological armor and enter the political arena and strike a blow for equality or feminism or motherhood or the status quo or whatever. This war has been fought before and apparently the issue decided. Yet again, in the spring of 1975, the halls of the state capitol resound with the talk of unisexual toilets, of homosexual marriages, and commies subverting the family. Once more, we vote on the Equal Rights Amendment, and once more, 
the opposition raises the old specters. Will my wife be drafted to fight in some president's war? Will Junior speak with a lisp? Will Dora have a mustache and drive a truck? These are the gut level emotional issues that remain after rational proponents of both sides have debated the legal effects of the amendment. Responsible and articulate people argue the legal weaknesses of ERA in the United States Congress, and then Congress approved the ERA. Responsible and articulate people argued in Albany against the New York State ratifying the 27th Amendment to the United States Constitution, and the state legislature ratified the 27th Amendment to the United States Constitution. It is not my purpose, Madam President, to restoke old calls, but rather to point out the weaknesses of some of the more irrational arguments being raised in opposition to S. 2824, which adds to Section 13, Article 1 of the State Constitution, providing equality of rights which should not be denied on account of sex. It is said by many groups speaking in opposition to ERA that the amendment signals the death knell of family life, that with equality before the law, this age-old institution, mainly the family, surely must crumble. That if New York State accords men and women equal treatment, the most intimate of human social relationships, a relationship that predates recorded history, shall go the way of the dinosaur. In 1916, these same arguments were heard as the state of Tennessee debated the issue of women's suffrage. Then as now, some religious leaders spoke in their usual progressive fashion as did the Reverend T.H. Harrison, who said, and I quote verbatim, this tragedy to which the human family is drifting is known as woman's suffrage. The age in which we are living is distinctly an age of unrest. The question of woman's suffrage, if put into effect, is simply a key that is going to unlock the gates of hell and turn the demons loose upon the human family. In the same vein, A. A. Lyon of Nashville added the following. The tendency of women's suffrage is, and will continue to be, to disturb the homogeneity of families, to promote divorces, to multiply old bachelors and old maids, to arraign in the business world the man against the woman, thus leading to personal antagonism, creating a strong tendency to the annulment of the true community interest, without which no civilized nation can be prosperous and happy. Most of those involved, I don't I that, and I'll tell you later. Most of those involved in the ERA debate have grown to maturity since these words were spoken in 1916. Those who adhere to the view that ERA will destroy the family should ask themselves if their mother's right to vote destroyed their family, and perhaps the answer will shed light on their current views. Another argument against ERA is that it is a leftist plot, that it is a communist back plan to attack and weaken basic American beliefs and the American way of life. It is pointed out that groups backing ERA include libbers and marchers and lesbians and limp-wristed fellows, and that surely such a motley throng are doing the work of Moscow. However, even if Senator Javits, Governor Carey, 
Lieutenant Governor Mary Ann Krepsak, Attorney General Lefkowitz, and Betty Ford have become communist puppets, it becomes essential to remember that it is not the speakers who are important, but the force of their ideas. The final resolution of great issues is what survives an age, not the mortals who may have waged the struggle. It was a carpenter who spoke of loving thy neighbor, an anarchist who told a crowd of revolutionaries to give him liberty or death. It is the power of the thoughts that survive time, not the politics or personal habits of the speakers. Is the idea of equality so foreign to American beliefs? Is an end to discrimination a threat to American life? Have we strayed so far from our roots that these ideals are what the communists are using to destroy our society? Wherein does the danger truly lie? I urge you, men and women on both sides of the aisle, to pass the Equal Rights Amendment and put the issue before the people. I vote in the affirmative. Senator Goodman. Uh, Madam President, at the outset of my remarks, I should like to pay a special tribute to three of our colleagues who, in my judgment, have waged one of the most enlightened and logically forceful campaigns for the adoption of legislation that I've witnessed during my period as a senator. I think that Senators Bellamy and Burston and Winnicott deserve the salute of all of us for recognizing that the strong tide of logic would eventually prevail if it were marshaled with a certain dispassionate clarity of precisely the type they have used. I think it's been, in plain language, a highly professional and skillful piece of legislative work, and I think for this the people of the state of New York are very much in your debt. Perhaps it symbolizes more adequately than anything that we might say in terms of abstract concepts the fact that it, the equality of women is self-evident. The opponents of this legislation, however, have failed completely to address themselves to one very crucial nucleus of argument that I think needs to be examined before this debate can be considered complete. Madam President, if it were possible for men to become pregnant, I have a feeling that the tremendous dispute which has ranged about the problem of pregnancy disability insurance coverage would never have to be discussed in this chamber. I do not think it likely, however, that men will become pregnant in the foreseeable future, and hence I think that we do have to address ourselves to one point in the ERA discussion which is a very hard economic point that the opposition have not chosen to examine up to this point. If one were a pregnant female working at a job in industry today, one would be paying precisely the same amount out of pocket with respect to disability insurance. If you had a heart attack or if you had uh, some difficulty with uh, excessive cholesterol accumulation or if you had any one of a number of difficulties that beset us, you would be covered by insurance for the amount of time it was necessary for you to be away from your job. If, however, you happen to be a female and you were pregnant and you incurred a disability in connection with pregnancy, although you and your male counterpart can it's statistically proven have been away from your job the same amount of time overall, the woman is discriminated against by not being permitted to be covered under pregnancy disability. Now the implications of this are profoundly disturbing. No one has ever attempted to marshal logic to suggest that women are not entitled to coverage for disability, except when the disability is due to pregnancy. When the Equal Rights Amendment becomes law in the state of New York, this 
unfortunate, obvious, and blatant, and economically significant piece of discrimination will be banished. And hence, we're not just talking about questions as to whether there shall be bisexual accommodations for daily matters, which have already been so exhaustively examined I won't reopen them, reopen them. whether men and women use the same toilet facilities is almost preposterously irrelevant to the discussion of the true economic significance of the Equal Rights Amendment, the pocketbook nerve impact of this crucially important measure. As a matter of elemental fairness, the legislature of the state of New York simply cannot any longer tolerate a situation in which women, only because they are women, are getting a raw deal, are getting a raw deal economically, are having to pay something which men do not pay because they're women and for no other reason. Hence, Madam President, it seems to me that this is a signal occasion. The legislature has just overwhelmingly crushed the opposition it's reflected in those in favor of the Eckert Amendment, and I think that we shall see an even more convincing vote, as it's my understanding, after a careful canvas of our colleagues in the course of this matter, that there were many who had a problem with the Eckert Amendment, but the steamroller movement will be total with regard to the matter under debate at this time. And because the enthusiasm and because the momentum and because the adoption of this measure will be done with such conviction by this legislature, I think, frankly, that we'd all be entitled after this to rejoice because we struck a tremendous blow in which you, Madam President, I may say, should also be given kudos for your own articulate advancement of this cause. And it is therefore with some real enthusiasm and a sense of thrill that I add my voice to those in support of this. And for this reason, I shall vote with an enthusiastic affirmative when given the opportunity. All right, now wait a second. Madam President, uh, we all arrive at this point and at this vote by many different routes. Uh, and many of the points which are raised go very deeply into our own personalities as much as to the laws and uh, future laws involved. Um, I know that my mother worked most of her life, and uh, therefore I have before me the inspiration, or to put it psychologically, the image of a working woman, self-reliant, independent, who nevertheless raised a family and was a loving mother. Uh, and I was able to come to this vote with not only a full understanding of its legal ramifications and the liberal elements contained in the words of the amendment, but also with the feeling for what women's rights can mean in the future. Even so, as I came to understand the amendment, I still asked myself, what really was the purpose? What really would be accomplished by the amendment in terms of how it would affect daily life and the actual uh, living and self-image of women? And it was not until I received the, the letter that I'm going to read that I really understood the amendment, its impetus, its meaning, and its justice fully. I received it from a constituent, and I would like to read it into the record, if I may. She writes, it's indeed a shame that rights already mandated tacitly in the Constitution must yet have another amendment in order to be enforced. Nevertheless, this situation does exist and must be dealt with. An increasing number of women must work to keep their families together or even support them completely on their own. They certainly do not work to find themselves or to be fulfilled. They work to keep their children warm and fed to provide a decent place to live. They must have the rights to which every United States citizen is entitled in order to provide the basics of life for their dependents. As a black woman, although young and well-educated and skilled, I have experienced the laissez-faire administration of rights regulations. It can only be immeasurably worse for any woman who has marginal skills or lacks skills of any sort. It is for their sake that I ask your support of this amendment. 
Please consider the well-being of all your constituents, including those who have not got the time to write and let you know that we are concerned. We are all concerned. We are women who are single, women who have been suddenly widowed and left with children to raise on limited income, or none at all. We are women divorced and inadequately protected under community property laws. We are women not allowed to take certain jobs because they are not, quote, women's work. Women discriminated against in pension funds after a lifetime of hard, honest work. So much for the mother image or the support image or the, or the, uh, uh, the pension social security image. She goes on. We are not affluent women backed by powerful, wealthy institutions who have the time to bake cute loaves of bread and hand them to legislators with charm, vivacity, and a pamphlet. We give our families the bread we bake, and the bus or plane fare to Albany is put to other uses, such as train fare to work. We haven't time to organize behind a wealthy woman and her friends who have never even had to apply for a job, much less to endure being paid less than a man for doing the same work women who have maids to feed their children. We are Phyllis Shackley's secretaries, maids, and cooks. Give us a chance. I think that is what the amendment is going to mean. And it means something that every man and woman in this chamber is here to do, to assist people who want to work, to work, and to work on equal terms with everyone else. And that is essentially what the Equal Rights Amendment can bring about. Madam President, I am a uh, co-sponsor of a pregnancy insurance measure uh, benefiting women, of course, which Senator Goodman would certainly agree with. Not exactly the bill he talked about, but uh, it's a measure which is overdue, which would benefit women. I've been a supporter and sponsor of several bills benefiting women, and specifically widows. I'm committed to equal rights for all, and certainly including based on sex. But a hoax is being perpetrated here today. This constitutional amendment has been pushed hard across the whole state, not only by NOW and the League of Women Voters, and other organizations with motives less clear and perhaps less noble than the uplifting of women, by resolution of various local units of government who are oblivious of and will not be held responsible, as we surely will be, for the consequences of their actions, and by elements of the mass media who seek to encourage enactment of this amendment in ignorance of its destructive potential. Let the record show that this amendment will not help women. It's not designed to. It doesn't even mention women. Even its supporters agree that where women now receive preferential treatment, such preferences must either be extended to men or must be taken away from women. This is equality with a vengeance, and women will suffer as a result. Many housewives and mothers will be forced onto the labor market while their children run the streets because they're separated their divorced husbands will no longer be required to support them. Who in this chamber has had the occasion to review all the changes which will be mandated in the correction law, domestic relations law, family court act, military law, real property law, tax law, and social services law? And if so, have you decided that all these distinctions should be eliminated? And if so, why are these discriminations on the books? Weren't they enacted by a legitimate legislature in a deliberate manner? and signed by our governors over many years? Have we now arrived at a consensus that these hundreds of statutes are wrong? And if so, why aren't the remedial measures before us now? Why not consider these changes? Why instead must we ask the citizens to mandate through a referendum that we make these changes? I might add, to mandate us by a constitutional amendment to discard wholesale all sex distinguishing laws regardless of their worth and regardless of the harmful consequences? And what about the irresponsible role played in this charade by the Law Revision Commission? 
With a year having passed since the ERA amendment was before this body last, and with our assertion that some 700 statutes would be affected, wouldn't it be reasonable to expect that they would have studied each of these statutes, prepared revised statutes, as they would have to be to conform to the amendment, and had all this material in the hands of the legislators before the date of this vote, in order that our decision might be based on an objective evaluation of the changes which we really are mandating if we vote affirmatively today. So that we might cast our vote based on its actual effect on our laws, and thereby on our society, on our lives, and on our families, and not based on the emotional actions and reactions of various groups. Plausible cases have been made by both sides, and much of the information disseminated has been directly 180 degrees opposed to the other. For example, although proponents claim that boys and girls' athletics, prison quarters, restrooms, and so on would not have to be sex integrated, but could be separate but equal, we know that the doctrine of separate but equal was overturned by the Supreme Court 20 years ago. Madam President, I have quite a few other comments here, but in view of the hour in my voice, I think I'd, I'll cut it a bit short. Let's just say that if we're going to end up with sex discrimination treated like racial discrimination and end up with quotas for employment in all um, government bureaus as the federal government is now imposing racial quotas and religious quotas and even yes, sex quotas and using the big stick of federal money to gain their way. And I don't think this is my idea of equality of opportunity for women or for anybody else. And I don't think that's in accordance with America's ideals if we end up with quota systems for men and women. In summary, then, as it stands, without the salutary amendment proposed by Senator Eckert, I see my responsibility to my constituents requiring me to vote no on this proposed amendment. The multitude of unanswered questions and the likelihood of women suffering grievous losses and making no gains under this measure are more than sufficient reason for caution. A year from now, if this amendment should prevail, we will know the consequences. Then it will be too late. And the citizens, men and women of this state, will demand an explanation from those who foisted this bogus equality on them. Senator McCall. There was one member who um, was out of the room when we gave the opportunity uh, to those who should have who had this commitment elsewhere. Senator Levy was on my right. I wonder if we could indulge the chamber and ask the secretary to uh, read the last section for permission, permitting uh, Senator Levy to express himself. The chair sees no reason to deny Senator Levy the opportunity. Call the senator's name. Mr. Levy. Aye. Call Senator Johnson's name. Mr. Johnson. You are. Pardon me, Oh, I'm sorry, Madam President. Yeah. Senator Johnson. Same applies to Senator Johnson. I, I don't know. Senator McCall. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I stand to speak in, in favor of this amendment. I do so recognizing as best I can the problems and the feelings of those people in our society who have been discriminated against because of their sex. Being a member of another minority group who knows something of these feelings of exclusion, these feelings of oppression and discrimination and degradation, I know that I cannot look to other people to speak for me and to tell how I feel, and therefore I can't really speak for women and, and tell how they feel. But I must say that I've been terribly impressed by women whose judgment I respect, who have convinced me that this is something that they want very badly. And really, in some ways, that, that's enough for me. One thing that I would like to mention rather briefly, uh, Madam President, is that many people in this chamber during our debate today stood to talk about the protections that are now available to women and how some of these protections will be taken away and denied if we are to pass this amendment. I found this just a little bit uh, humorous and a little bit contradictory, Madam President, because when I think about the protections that are available, 
it seems to me that we have been talking about protections for some women only. There are other women in our society, many women, who are looking for certain protections that haven't been available. And what I would say is if there are those people in this chamber who are really concerned about protecting the rights of women, where have their voices been during this session? When a bill which was offered by my good friend Assemblyman Posner, who has invaded our chambers and who is sitting here beside me, a bill that he introduced and was actually passed by the Assembly, has been bottled up in a committee in this chamber, a bill that would provide the, the protections and the guarantees and the rights of, of collective bargaining to women who happen to be domestic workers. Is it just that these women are black and poor, that we're not concerned about their protections? So I really can't accept this argument that we're concerned about the protection of women, because many women in our society haven't been protected by our laws. What I am standing to say, Madam President, is that what we have to do is provide the protections and the benefits and the liberties that women are asking for. And I have heard women in this society, in this chamber, say that what they want is the protection and the, and the guarantees that would come from the Equal Rights Amendment. There are some who talk about the breakdown of family life if this comes about. When you look at the escalating divorce rate in our country, we really wonder, can family life break down any more than it already has? And maybe the way in which we begin to stabilize family life in this country is to begin to give those liberties and those benefits to women so that we can begin to accept them and see them and support them as equal partners in every enterprise that we're engaged in, including the enterprise of marriage. And it's only by giving them that kind of support and that kind of protection and those kinds of guarantees and that kind of liberation where we begin to see the development and the continuation of stability in our family life. In closing, Madam President, let me only say this, that I find it a little bit ironical that those people who are opponents of the Equal Rights Amendment call their effort Operation Wake Up, because it seems to me that the only thing that the Equal Rights Amendment really does is to start an effort to wake up a nation which has been asleep to the oppression of women since the very birth of this nation. Senator Donovan. May I inquire, Madam President, how many more speakers you have listed? Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, and the majority leader and the minority leader, and yourself, Senator. Seven after me? Seven after you. Senator Noor, your name is on the list now. I was giving some consideration to relinquishing my spot if... Uh, Thank you, Senator Donovan. I have it. Uh, <laughs> on the assumption that I might be last. Not that I take any special pleasure in being last, but if there are seven others or nine more behind me, then uh, perhaps I uh, should read into the record what I have prepared. If others were inclined to follow what might be my example, I might reconsider at this late hour. Not hearing anything, I'll proceed. <clears throat> Senator, you certainly are entitled to speak, but for the record, the other senators are senators who did not speak on the amendment, on the Eckerd Amendment, if that helps you to decide on your... It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Madam President, at this time I would like to withdraw my name from the list in order to maybe induce Senator Dalvin and others to do the same. Huh. I'd, like, I'd like to withdraw my name from the list, too. <laughs> Senator Gallagher, I think you did speak on the amendment. Did, am I correct in saying that you did not want to speak on the main bill? No? That's right. Senator Gallagher's name is off the list. Uh, uh, Senator Isabella, do you still wish to speak? What's that? Senator Isabella, do you still wish to speak? The senators are, various senators are, are choosing to withdraw their names from the list to close the discussion. The chair is merely inquiring whether you wish to keep your name on the list to speak or whether you would relinquish your time. No, man. Definitely I want to keep my name on the list. I've waited this long and, and I'm going to stay on it. Never. And I want to say for the record, I resent it very much that a special rule was made to allow senators to leave 
when I had to sit here all this time and listen to their diatribe and take it in one ear and out the other ear, I think they should stay here and listen to me. Maybe I can convince a few of them. But because what will be said in the newspaper will not be, be accurately recorded is what I'm going to say on this floor. I resent it very much. I don't know why. Senator, your, Senator, Senator, your name will remain on the list. Senator Maybe we should get on with it, Madam President. <clears throat> He's right, too. Yeah. Uh, Madam President, uh, speaking to those who are present and the, those who uh, absented themselves for a good and sufficient reason, uh, I've prepared a few remarks that I'd like to read it to the record. And obviously, it isn't right to change the final outcome, but uh, this may be the last time any of us will have an opportunity to speak to this uh, proposition. We're deciding today whether to take a trip to an undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. It is not the much simpler choice between life and death. It is whether we want to stay in this time and place and retain our right, and thus the people's right, to determine their course of action for all time to come, or whether we shall deprive them of that right and extend it instead solely to that small number in the judiciary who do not seek appointment or election and how they will decide issues, but only on the wisdom they bring to the office they seek. That wisdom has more than once failed the will of the people and will do so again. We're debating whether to add a simple sentence to the constitutional state of the ark that is proclaimed as a panacea for all the evils that the state of the ark has visited upon women from time immemorial. With infallible certitude, its advocates have told us what it will and won't do, and for that matter, so have the opponents. Regardless of the merits of these assertions, and in most cases they are nothing more than predictions, one thing is certain, and that is that there will be no turning back if this amendment is adopted. We will be in that undiscovered legal jungle, armed only with the triplets from the League of Women Voters and the Yale Law School Journal. The voice of this body and the assembly will have been silenced, and with it, the voice of the people who sent us here. If there are to be any future distinctions between men and women, those distinctions will be as determined by our courts. We will no longer be able to return to this house and adopt laws that may benefit women. So it is argued, let the people have a voice in this in November in determining their future. There's only one reason for letting the people vote this November, and that is that those who favor this amendment are abundantly aware that the tide is turning against it. They know that as more and more people question the wisdom of the amendment, because they have come to learn more of its possible implications than its chances for adoption, as its chances for adoption grow small. Given sufficient information, the people of the state of the art demonstrated a capacity for wisdom that frequently exceeds that of this body, august body, and the courts of our state. We are used to stampedes. We are undergoing one now. But why should we visit a stampede upon them? Who in justice can stand up and tell the people of New York State with absolute certainty what this amendment will bring? How can we say which laws of the state the amendment will change and how it will change them? The Law Revision Commission has been given the job of determining the statute that would be altered should the amendment be adopted. Not until this March did a preliminary report emanate from the commission that was sketchy at the best. But there are no signs that a complete report will be completed before a referendum vote in November. How can we have the audacity to ask the people of New York to vote on an amendment whose full ramifications are not known by this body, let alone the people of the state? What the Commission knows and has so informed us is that hundreds of laws must be changed. And both sides in this debate will concede that. But which laws are they, and what will, they, will the, uh, be the effects of their alteration? 
How can we, as good conscience, stand here and tell the voters of this state that this so-called equality amendment will change hundreds of laws and offer them only a partial list completed by the Commission? If we approve this resolution today, we can answer only that the equality advocates could not wait, that it was now or never for them, that the amendment could not stand up under public scrutiny. So it is argued, let the public scrutinize the amendment between now and November. Scrutinize with me and the public one of the latest treatises on what the amendment won't do, a treatise to which some of us were attracted by the jolly face of our colleague, Senator Eckert. The subject is the effect of the amendment on child custody. The treatise suggests that women's equality will not change state law calling for a custody that is in the child's best interest, nor will it change the lack of statutory presumption that one sex or the other will get custody. Who can argue with that? Will our laws change to make custody awards that are not in the best interest of the child? If we are adopting an amendment that calls for equality between the sexes, are we, as a diametrically opposed result, to adopt a statutory presumption that favors one sex over the other? Thus, this is not only not given us the answer to the question, it is not given us the question, which is whether more fathers can expect custody of their children upon divorcing under ERA than without it. Anyone halfway familiar with custody awards in this state knows full well that the only way a woman can be denied custody of her children is if she employs her little children to serve whiskey in her bordello for plague-ridden ridden heroin addicts and paid them below the minimum wage. And then the courts would take the children away because she paid below the minimum wage. It seems to me that if we are to emblazon the rights of women to do everything she pleases upon the forms of all within reach, then we should be prepared to concede that every once in a while a plain, ordinary Man has an equal right to his plain, ordinary wife to the custody of their children upon their divorce. If we do not concede this right to a man under ERA, then we are conceding that he is categorically not equal to a woman. And if this is the case, then the amendment is a fraud, for we will be proclaiming an equality that does not exist. But if it is not the case, if the ERA means that fathers have an equal right for custody, and if only a small fraction of those fathers are deemed better qualified for custody, as surely many of them are now, then in a short time this state will have thousands of fathers in custody of their children. As much as anything else, the present unspoken dictum that the mother always gets custody is a, is a rule of administrative convenience which is to say that if the rule were to change, the courts would be faced with hearing evidence as to the qualification of the individual parents for custody. And this not only would be an inconvenience, it would take away many of the hours of the court's time. For I ask, how can the public know what ERA might result in more fathers being awarded custody if their information is confined to the knowledge that a statutory presumption that does not exist will not change. I ask that those of you in this chamber who argue that ERA will not change the custody laws to stand up here today and tell the women of the state that they can be absolutely certain that ERA will not mean that more and more men will get custody of their children. I suggest to you that ERA will place the question of custody squarely before the courts. And if we are to have the equality that is purported to bring, then the courts will have no other choice but to alter, not the custody laws, but their practice in applying them. Why is it that the federal ERA, our federal ERA snowball is melting? Why is it that at first, state after state, including New York, voted for this similarly simple little amendment. But now state after state is rejecting it, and two, no, and two have reversed their previous votes.
The answer is that more and more legislators have become aware of its possible consequences. The early ERA battles were won by default. There was little opposition, and there was little opposition because the import of the amendment was not known. In our own state, the opposition to the amendment this year is multiplied many times over the opposition of last year, and for the same reasons affecting the decline of ERA nationally. As the opposition has increased, so have the number of issues surrounding the amendment. When we voted for the federal ERA, there was little discussion of whether it would permit homosexual marriages, what would happen to our alimony, child support or custody laws, how it would affect our prisons, our police and fire departments, our rape laws, privacy, public athletic teams, and those laws designed to protect women. Nor were we concerned with how many state laws would be changed as a result. It is only the past year that we and the public have been treated to a discussion in the news media of the implications of the amendment. And more news space was devoted to the gains made by women in employment, in filling new occupations, in credit, in being awarded back pay and in other social advances than in discussing the amendment. We know now, for example, that women are prison guards in San Quentin, where they watch men prisoners take showers. The only five of 50 women sailors assigned to sea duty became pregnant during the first few months aboard ships. We know that a man was awarded custody of his children and a $200 a month from his wife when they were divorced, and each was earning $17,000 a year. It can be argued that the federal amendment is 50 years old and that women since Eve have hungered for equality, and with some that may be the case. The point is that for the first time, we are now discussing whether a state amendment will bring that equality. The issues have become controversial, and with the augmented controversy has come no major movement for an unbiased study that would attempt to unravel the controversy and present the possible implications of an amendment in a cool, unemotional light. What we have been subjected to instead is hard and fast pronouncements as to the lack of consequences of the amendment. We are told with certainty that the amendment will not change state laws preventing homosexual marriages. But if a court decides that they violate ERA, they will be changed. We are told with certainty that our custody laws will not change. But if a court decides otherwise, application will change. We are told in brief that the amendment will have no effects other than to bring long denied rights to women. But if the courts decide otherwise, that will not be the case. I am not prepared to present a long list of state laws that must be changed, such as we will one day receive from the Law Revision Commission. But in flipping through a few pages of the labor law, you will find the following existing law. Quote, there shall be provided and maintained for employees in every factory suitable and convenient washrooms separate for each sex. There shall be provided in every factory where females are employed such dressing or emergency rooms as shall be specified. There shall be separate water closet compartments or toilet rooms for females." End of quote. I'm not prepared to suggest that ERA will mean that we shall be forced with integrating washrooms, water closets, and dressing rooms. The question is whether the factory owner shall be forced to provide separate facilities, not necessarily by the court in 1977, but maybe by a court in 1997. <clears throat> it is a salient observation that those <clears throat> espousing the cause of ERA are not demanding segregation of restrooms. They are not insisting that restrooms be kept separate. They insist only that EIA will not have an impact on the existing separations. The National Organization for Women in their literature insists that all public facilities be integrated and make no exceptions. I'm not quite sure what they mean in terms of that pronouncement in their literature. It is just as salient to observe that those demanding female entry into those occupations that are traditionally male 
stop short when it comes to athletic teams. Therefore, we shall <clears throat> have men and women architects, men and women steeplejacks, men and women bankers, men and women bricklayers, and we shall open up our schools so that women may be trained equally for these occupations. But we shall provide more funding for separate women's athletic teams. If a woman wants to study accounting, we will make sure she gets into an accounting class if she meets the qualifications. But if she wants to play shortstop and can't meet the qualifications, we will provide her with a separate team so she will not be deprived of fulfilling herself. We will do this while denying a similar fulfillment to the male shortstop as qualified as a female but not qualified for the male varsity. I suggest to you today that if those advocating ERA hold to their principle that each of us should be able to participate in those endeavors of our choice and for which we qualify, it will move an end to women's athletics in high school and college. In these days of orbiting school costs, where we have witnessed school districts all over the country considering the elimination of varsity sports, should we have separate athletic teams? If the courts rule that we are persons, that will mean an end to those teams, and this body will be powerless to change such a ruling. Perhaps by some strange stretch of judicial imagination, women's athletics will be upheld under ERA on the grounds that it is involved with the right of privacy. If that is the case, it will not be because, as the League of Women Voters has asserted, there is a constitutional right of privacy, which most assuredly there is not, or because, as the League of Women Voters has propagated all over the state, a Supreme Court decision in Connecticut case upheld the right of privacy, which is, it most assuredly did not. The League, which is described as a good government group, has argued that the courts will consider the intent of the legislature in deciding cases arising out of ERA. And the League is not alone in its argument. Let us then remove those controversies surrounding the enactment of this amendment. Let us eliminate any questions that the courts may have in years to come over what this body intended when it adopted this resolution. Let us tell the voters that we are not giving the courts a carte blanche. Senator Donovan, would you suffer an interruption? Senator Padovan, why do you rise? Just to count the houses. Excuse me, Senator Donovan. <laughs> <laughs> Could I inquire how many we have after his count? I'm <clears throat> sorry, Senator Donovan. Proceed. Let us tell the voters that we are not giving the courts a carte blanche to do with ERA whatever it chooses. Let us make it abundantly, cl abundantly clear that it is not our intent to remove those laws offering protection to women. Shall we permit ERA to advance with conjecture passing for judicial certainty or shall we make it clear to the people of the state that there is no doubt in our minds what we want this amendment to do? Shall we thrust before the voters an amendment that will change a multitude of state laws and confess to those voters that we do not know what those laws are, let alone the impact of each change? Shall we tell the women of the state that we are forever giving up the right of the legislature and thus the right of the people to adopt a single law offering protection to women? Who is holding the gun at our heads? Shall we, be co shall we be coerced into boarding the train to the undiscovered country? There will be another train if we are to board it. Let us know more about that strange land we are to move to. We can legislate the laws of that land today, but if we ride there today, that opportunity will be forever lost. Yes, amendments would have delayed the adoption of this resolution. Yes, a wait for the Commission's report would have delayed the adoption of the amendment. But if we are to have ERA, then is it not in the interest of all the people of our state to make it clear what portends and to make clear our in intention in adopting it? I will not vote to strip this body of its rights to offer protection to women 
women are not equal. They are more than equal. Let those of you who would change this vote for ERA today. a grave error. My name appears on the bill. I want this body to know that I ask that my name be removed the day before or the day after this bill was printed many weeks ago. And for some reason unknown to me, my name has not been removed. So be. But even if it was put on there by me, it has to be put on by me, after I did a thorough research on the CRA, I've come to the conclusion that I'm going to vote against it. I'm sorry that there are not enough men here to listen to me. I think that if I had more here, I think that what I have to say, I could change maybe a few minds and maybe swing this vote one way or the other. This being such an important piece of legislation coming up here, I don't think the rule should be made where a man should be allowed to leave. Maybe because of Lewis being sick and Burst, Bernstein having a swollen foot, okay. But the others, no way. I waited this long, I think they should wait. My arguments against the ERA. The Equal Rights Amendment is an illusion and not a solution. The problems of inequality in the system in respect to sex as to race, age, and other human characteristics is rooted not in so much not so much in the Constitution as in powerful social customs that have successfully defied attempts to correct them by statute. Racial equality was adopted by the Constitutional Amendment following the Civil War, but the first major progress in effecting it came nearly a century later when the public was ready to make it meaningful. It is legal certain, its legal certainty is even today being challenged from coast to coast. The remedy being sought by ERA is not likely to follow its adoption. Only the form will change, each issue being decided one by one through costly and time-consuming challenges in courts, appeal after appeal. The course of action is already available. The objectives of the ERA is already met in the existing federal constitution. The problem of getting courts to force bureaucracies and businesses to conform will not significantly change should ERA be ratified. One of the most significant passages in the American law is the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. It is not only the basis of our due process protection, it has been used to make most federal civil rights applicable to state law as well. And I wish to quote it. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or the immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any persons of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any persons within its jurisdiction the equal, equal protection of the laws. And I stay here in quotations. It says persons, not man, not woman, but persons. This has been so broadly interpreted in the past that it has even been judged to include and protect the rights of business corporations. Obviously, it can protect the rights of women. The differential treatment of women, whether less than equal or more than equal, is not rooted in our Constitution so much as in our religious and customary beliefs. The latter have proven... Have proven... Go slow, go slow, go slow. <laughs> Thank you. We'll wait for you. Just go slow. Very Thank you. The latter, having proven to be massively unresponsive to changes in man-made laws, indeed the law simply reflects our values as a society. With language such as the 14th Amendment uses, does anyone seriously suppose that human behavior will change because of one more amendment? More than it did in response to the immediate provocation for the adoption of the 13th, 
the 14th and the 15th Amendment, all of which were on the books for more than 100 years. We must look to history to recognize that most of our currently offensive discriminatory legislation and administration grew out of a lifestyle in which virtually all people at one time acquiesced. The women's suffrage, 19th Amendment, was so ratified in 1920 and could have been extended to more states by the same vote required to ratify the amendment. It is, it is interesting now to speculate whether the present institutional lag behind changing social values, values were not made more difficult by the use of the constitutional amendment route in 1919 rather than persistent court challenges and legislation to establish women's rights to vote under the language of the 14th Amendment. The amendment was a concession to the claim that the right did not exist in prior law. Now we find the same 19th Amendment being cited as evidence that women are not persons in the language of the 14th Amendment by the advocates of the ERA. We will later need further amendments to clarify what we hope the 27th Amendment would accomplish. The hidden difficulty in all constitutional amendments is that a adding words tends to be restrictive even when its aim is to be liberalizing. It is often noted, matter of record, that longer and more complex state constitutions are one most frequently in need of amendment. I think most and everyone will agree that the United States Constitution is the best in the world. It is also one of the shortest, although once for every eight years of its history, amended once in every eight years of its history, one in twelve of you exclude the Bill of Rights package, we have made more mistakes in response to immediate passionate issues leading to amendment than the Founding Fathers made without even benefit of knowing, know, whether knowing whether it would work. The 21st was made necessary because the 18th Amendment bombed. Truman and Eisenhower both admitted their mistakes in yielding to the anti-FDR pressure in limiting presidential terms of office, the 20th Amendment, not that we want more than three presidents, but in the absence of that possibility, President Eisenhower found that he had lost the power of his office shortly after his final term began. The 24th Amendment, the poll tax, should have been disposed of by legislation and further with court action. The last of these is a good point. Man's imagination is sufficient to concoct any number of voting disabilities. By outlawing just one, however great the nuisance, through the Constitution, we would appear to be saying that others are legitimate. So others were in fact tried. Three years after the ratification of the 24th, Congress passed a Voting Rights Act that spelled out what should have been clear in the 14th and the 15th Amendments. It could have included what went into the 24th. By 1965, the Supreme Court was prepared to agree. Unfortunately, the 24th Amendment remains as a, as a suggestion to future demagogues and courts that voting rights can be impaired so long as race, color, and previous conditions of servitude, sex, poll taxes, and the 18-year-old minimum age are not involved. These are four of the last 12 amendments. If the proper case could be brought before the United States Supreme Court, one that would have to be decided on the desired issue and not on some procedural point or secondary question, and if the court could be led to discover that the Constitution already says what the ERA wants it to say, then all previous interpretations of the balance of the Constitution would apply equally to men and women. Presumably opponents of one or another existing law that allegedly favors either man or woman would challenge them on the basis of the primary decision. Very soon the limits of what is or is not permissible distinction under equal protection of the law would become clear. If the Equal, right, equal Rights Amendment is passed, it will have no automatic meaning. No new law has much meaning until it is tested in court. Unless the ERA has the unusual good fortune of having the Supreme Court specifically state that it subsumes all previous court decisions relative to equal protection, which is extremely unlikely, then this new amendment will only be applied by trying every statute and administrative decision that is challenged on the basis of conflict with ERA's provisions. In short, both procedures involve using courts. The ERA route is all, is all but certain to be the longer. One notes with pleasure which a recent New York City court case was greeted by the ERA advocates. 
In that case, a minimum height rule for police officers was found to be inapplicable to women. Under present law, it is conceivable that the court has ruled that men must be at least five foot seven, that women need only be five foot two. After ERA, one would expect every short male who was excluded for what was previously thought to be a reasonable standard to change the provisions as sex discrimination. It would not be at all surprising at that point to have the court find in favor of the taller minimum height for both sexes since size, like it or not, can be related to the effectiveness, effectiveness of some <coughs> occupations. It's very dry. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, that ain't water. <laughs> I think somebody's trying to kill me. <laughs> That's not water. <laughs> the problem to which EIA addresses itself is real. In numerous institutions, including government, there is definite disparity in the treatment of men and women. The inequities work both ways, but the rising pressures derive from the changing role of women in, work, in the workforce in career advancements, and in their more independent activities in business and credit. All rules of thumb that serve to sort out job and credit risks are no more applicable. It does not matter that perhaps a majority of women are perfectly content with the status quo. As is usually the case, the majority does not feel intensely about this issue, one way or the other. The de those demanding change tend to be better educated, somewhat more affluent, and independent thinking people. They are articulate and far more likely than their opponents to shape the outcome of elections. We all know that. The common claims of this movement, equal pay for equal work, equal opportunity for employment and advancement, equal access to credit and business services, equal standing under the laws of, for property, disability and retirement, among others, seems to be as inevitably the future law of the land as anything, as anything one can predict. Not because of a handful of aggressive feminists is, is making threatening gestures, but because it is firmly grounded in, in, in existing constitutional law. Not... <laughs> I'd ask that them in the back here to stop speaking because... Senator, just a moment, please. Every senator is entitled, even the senator from the 44th district. <laughs> senator, <laughs> senator, I don't have much more. senator, you're quite correct. The chair was jesting. Will the guests in the chamber please refrain from having private conversations and take seats in various parts of the chamber? There's plenty of room in the gallery now, and allow the members to complete the discussion of this resolution. Senator Isabella. <coughs> Not because the previous legal arrangements were all wrong, but because our lifestyle has changed without a corresponding adjustment of those legal arrangements. The ERA comes to us as a crisis because the past legislatures and courts have been too slow to respond. Hopefully, the federal and state constitutional amendments will be stalled long enough for the perfect case to reach the United States Supreme Court or some sensitive and insightful judges on that court find a case which to update the 14th Amendment, making the ERA new. The proposed Equal Rights Amendment is the wrong way to go about a perfectly legitimate campaign for correcting a legal wrong. So is forced blessing. But until legislatures act more responsibly to the changing society, we are going to face pressures, politics, crash programs, and expensively inappropriate compromises. In conclusion, to say that women need the ERA in order to gain constitutional rights is a grave distortion of the facts. The Supreme Court of this nation has repeatedly cited the Equal Protection Clauses of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment as applying equally to women. And to put one more amendment on the books with all the attended confusion over meaning and interpretations that accompanies any new law absolute, does absolutely nothing to guarantee the equality of women in our society. Thank you for listening. Senor. 
Madam President, this has been kind of a strange, strange and unusual debate here today. You know, ordinarily, when legislation is proposed, the introducer or the proponent of the legislation advances reasons why it will confer benefits on those who are the subject of the legislation. Now, what we have heard here today, especially in the colloquy between uh, Senator Winnicow and Senator Bernstein, Bernstein, was, don't worry, it will have no bad effects. This legislation is fine. It can't possibly hurt anybody, and especially will it not delete any of the laws that are beneficial, presently beneficial to women. This has been a negative kind of a, an approach. They haven't shown us a single specific instance where this legislation will benefit in the way of equal rights for women. Do you yield to a question of Senator Bell? No, I'm not going to. Merely going to question. offer an illustration. And that, I was hoping that today, before this debate ended, that the proponents of this legislation would come forward and show us in what way and in what manner it would specifically the benefit women of the state. That hasn't happened at all. All we have been assured of is it's a great, wonderful piece of legislation. It has important philosophical connotations, but nothing at all in the way of specifics as to how it will benefit the female sex. Senator Bellamy. Yeah. I get my button on. 